As Scott said, our first scripture lesson this morning is Psalm 124. You can find this in the Old Testament section of your pew Bibles at page 572. Listen now for the word of God. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The New Testament lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. I'll be reading verses 38 through 50, and this can be found on page 45 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen again for the word of God. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, It would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The word of the Lord. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Living, holy, and gracious God, take all of the words of our mouths and take all of the thoughts and the meditations that stir around in our hearts. Take them, O God, and make them yours. Help us to know what we need to do in order to be faithful to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So, it is the case that we never come to scripture texts in a vacuum, whenever we come to read the Bible, um, we always come to scripture out of the circumstances and the experiences of our lives. We bring the varied experiences that we each have had with us whenever we turn to a passage from the Bible. And though uh, this past week has been good for those of us who wanted the presbytery vote to shake out the way the presbytery vote shook out, it is also the case that this past week has been a hard week in these United States. The confirmation hearings this past week and the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh have exposed very deep divisions among us in the country and have brought us to an important 
national moment about power and truth and sexual assault and memories and pain. It has been a time when, for many people, painful and difficult memories have been reopened and reawakened. Our colleague, uh, Jan Edmiston, um, whom some of you know, a former co-moderator of our denomination and the spouse of Fred Lyon, former interim pastor here at Lewinsville, Jan wrote this past week on her blog that calls to reign the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, calls to reign reporting sexual assault spiked by 147% this past Thursday in the midst of the hearings. According to Rain, every 98 seconds, another person experiences sexual assault in our country. One out of every six women in the United States has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime, and one in every 33 men has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape. Now, we don't know how the confirmation process is going to play out, but stopping sexual assault and sexual violence is an issue for all of us. We all have a part to play in stopping it, and we've all got a lot to learn and I do think that that's especially the case for those of us who are men. And the church needs to be a community that stands against sexual violence and that listens to the voices of those who have been hurt, even when it's uncomfortable for us. Our two texts today that Mike read from Psalm 124 and Mark chapter 9 tell us that we should not be surprised to find ourselves in hard circumstances, hard realities, facing the challenges of hostility or enemies or conflict. But these two texts, the both of them, also speak to us of the presence of God in the midst of all of those realities and about our need to cultivate partnerships along the way and to develop self-awareness along the way. Psalm 124 looks to be a kind of call and response text about the realities of opposition and hostility in the world. According to the psalm, the people in the faith community, the people in Israel, are not shielded or insulated from enemy forces. Psalm 124 realizes that our enemies could have swallowed us, drowned us, or ensnared us like vulnerable little birds. And the psalm does not specify who those hostile forces are. They're simply referred to as our enemies, which permits us to ponder our own lives and to think about the hostile forces that we find ourselves encountering in our lives. And Psalm 124 wants to remind us that we never face our conflicts or our enemies or our hostilities on our own. Our help, the psalm says, is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Now, we know enough from reading the story of Israel in Scripture to know that Israel was not preserved from the teeth of their enemies. We know from reading the Scripture that Israel underwent enormous suffering at the hands of a whole variety of people over the years. There was slavery down in Egypt. There was abuse from the Assyrians. There was exile in Babylon. There was the colonialism of Persia and of Rome. So that tells us that Psalm 124 does not mean to say that the people who pray Psalm 124 are never going to have any trouble. Psalm 124 is telling us that when difficulties come to Israel 
and to the church who stand in the heritage of Israel, when difficulties come, we do not run afraid, but we lean into the promises that God is with us, helping them and helping us to face every challenge with grace, with dignity, and with courage. So, Psalm 124 wants to tell you that if you are in your own life facing some hostile force or some horrible memory or some powerful influence that wants to intimidate you or bully you or threaten you, know that you are not in that by yourself and you do not have to rely on your own resources alone. The same Lord who made heaven and earth is with you to help. Now, in the gospel text from Mark 9, the disciples, and in particular John, find themselves also in a situation of opposition, but in the gospel text, it's a situation that is their own making. Uh, John comes to Jesus and says, and I think he says this in sort of a braggy way, he says, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. We're over here. He's over there. He's not with us. So we tried to stop him. And it sounds a lot like they're expecting Jesus to kind of pat them on the head or say, Way to go, guys. Way to stick up for our team. Jesus knows all about hostile forces that may come. But Jesus is not out looking to make enemies. Instead of seeing the other person, the one who is casting out demons but who is not one of them, instead of seeing that person as an enemy or a competitor in the religious marketplace, Jesus sees him as a partner. Whoever is not against us is for us, Jesus says. What matters is not what team someone is on or what party they vote for or what gathering they belong to. What matters is that the other person is out working against forces that are demonic. Forces that are, we might think of them as the spiritualities in the world that are seeking to harm people or be cruel or mean to people. The Apostle Paul wrote in words that I think would be good for all of us to absorb and process and bear. Paul wrote that our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh. Our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And in that struggle, we need all of the partners that we can find. Mark 9 is one of the texts that makes it clear that the church always needs to be about building partnerships out beyond the church, partnering with other religious groups and with secular groups who are pursuing life-giving goals and outcomes. So if in your week, your life, you find a group that is working to reduce poverty, even if it doesn't have the PCUSA logo on it, join them. When you find a group that is working to end sexual violence, Join them. When you find a group that is working for good schools or working to heal and care for the environment, join them. And then Jesus goes on to summon his followers, by which he, we should understand he's inviting us. We who, like those early disciples, and this is a point where I hear this coming loud and clear at me. Jesus summons his followers who can be so quick and eager 
to point the finger at them, criticizing them, Jesus summons his disciples to a rigorous and, we may notice, rather graphic practice of self-critique. Jesus says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea to sleep with the fishes. <laughs> now, just parenthetically, we may observe that folks sometimes make the mistake of thinking that it is the Old Testament that presents a divine figure who is severe, while the New Testament is all sunny and rosy. But this text makes it clear that Jesus himself is no doormat, but is strong and prophetic. Jesus here is calling his followers to bear the well-being of others rigorously in mind. So that if we are doing something that blocks someone else from living a life of wholeness, then we need to cut it out. If we are engaged in a pattern of behavior that is benefiting one person or group and is doing so by harming another, then we need to cut it out. Jesus here is inviting the church to practice a hermeneutic of pain, to walk into the messy pain of the world and to allow the hurt and the pain in any given situation to teach us and to show us what God wants us to know and where God wants us to go. Listening for the voices of hurt and pain is not going to resolve every dispute that we have quickly and automatically, but listening for pain will give you a solid place to stand as we try to figure out where to go. One writer um, has said, over and over in the Bible, we see Jesus moving towards people's mess and miraculously coming through for them. Over and over in the Bible, we see Jesus moving towards people's mess and miraculously coming through for them. So friends, as we make our way through these messy days that we have been given, trying to love the Lord and to love our neighbor, we can face into every single challenge that comes our way in the knowledge, in the knowledge that Jesus is right now moving towards our mess, that he is present with us in every single piece of it, and that as we listen and draw upon the voice of the Lord, as we breathe in and breathe out the Spirit of the Lord, God has promised to lead us forward step by step. To God and to God alone be all of the glory now and forever. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Take us, O oh God, from where we are with all of our brokenness, all of our anxieties. Take us from where we are to where you want us to be. Fill our hearts, so fill our hearts with your spirit and with your grace that all fear will be pushed out and that we will be filled with your love and with your wisdom, with your patience, with your resilience, and with your resolve. All things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen.